Thank you. Good morning, everyone. We're on the record on September 4, 2019, with regard to the Douglas and Rosalind Barden versus Johnson and Johnson, David and Darlene Etheridge versus Johnson and Johnson, D'Angelo McNeil versus Johnson and Johnson, and William and Elizabeth Ryan versus Johnson and Johnson. Outside the presence of the jury, man, appearances, please. Good morning, Your Honor. Motion by the Chris Plessis, Chris Bennett, Chris Bennett. Good morning. Good morning. On behalf of the defendants, Johnson, Johnson, and Johnson, Johnson, and Johnson, 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 Joh
And so I determined that I'm going to indicate to the jury words to the effect of, um, it appears to the court based upon one of the questions submitted yesterday that the court's instruction yesterday morning may not have been clear. And so I'm giving you this instruction again to clarify. And I'm going to repeat the instruction that I gave yesterday morning, but also where it indicate um, the word biomarkers, I will also say biomarkers or fibers. So that is um, how the court intends to proceed. Is, there, is all the evidence now ready? It is, Your Honor. There's an instruction that uh, Mr. Miller and Mr. Panettier has agreed upon uh, regarding the FDA reporting sheet. Okay. And when would you like me to read that instruction? Um, at the end of our case, Your Honor. Okay. May Before I, we rest. Uh, sure. That's May I see it? Yes, Your Honor. So I'm going to ask if there's any uh, more witnesses, and at that point in time, I'm going to say no, but ask the court to read the instruction, and then you're going to rest. Yes, Your Honor. And then, uh, is Your Honor's plan that we just proceed to closing then? Uh, Yes. Okay. Uh, well, no, I will turn to the plaintiffs and ask if there's any opinion in rebuttal. And at that point in time, you want a sidebar? Well, we'll have direct verdict motions. Right. Um, so do you want to just preserve them now? Um, I think that I think yeah. now and preserve them. They're not going to change. Uh, okay. So uh, how long is, it, is the motion going to take? I have one motion to make that's going to take literally three minutes. Mine will take less than ten. All right. Uh, we'll hold you to that. Before we move on, let me go back to this because I want to make sure I have this correct. So I'm reading the bullet points, and then I come to a bullet point that's bracketed. Right, and so and, so, and then there's a, another arrow. What are you What are you asking me to? So if it was difficult for Your Honor to read the sort of handwritten notes we did with respect to that bullet, I just hand wrote it down oh, okay. here. So, so I'm just going to refer to that bullet point down here and then back up to this occurred between. So there's no dispute that John, J and J sent med watch forms for the event reports Dr. Hopkins was asked about, including the ones for these four previous two Correct? Mm -hmm. right. And um, what is this that's attached? Uh, that was just a document you to Mr. Penny that uh, demonstrate the basis for some of what I which I'll for you. Um, one other thing, um, and this relates to um, when the jurors uh, begin their deliberations, if they get to the alloc if they get to the allocation question, do you want to formulate a stipulation with regard to the years for JJCI and as opposed to J and J so that they know? We we did that already with Hopkins. He testified, and I'm going to of course address it in closing. So the evidence is in on. I don't think there's any harm with the stipulation. Right. We'll, we'll consider it, but you don't want to hold things up. Yeah. We believe the evidence is in the record. It, it's fine. And Your Honor, on the issue of time, and I think both parties are concerned about time and we'd like right. to get the closings in right. today. Uh, it may make sense to preserve to have the motions argued after the closings that they have. And also, um, I, I know there's, you know, Hopefully there won't be, but I suspect they'll have objections, and we will too. But if Your Honor can instruct that they're preserved and we can address them after the closings to try to get them both in today, that would, I think, make sense. It's, it's not my goal to stand up and object, but um, we brought a motion limiting in this case based on this uh, counsel's prior closing argument. Um, if none of that happens, I won't be objecting. Um, but I may be forced to, and um, but I don't plan to. <laughs> so, Thank you. Uh, what was the other motion that you had? Before? Motion to just as a formality, Your Honor, and I think this was dealt with in the product conference. All the plaintiffs must be directed to on the issue of product defect causation on the failure to warrant claim were entitled to the heating presumption that the defendants did not come forward with adequate evidence under New Jersey law to rebut the heating presumption. That was incorporated into the final charge that the court made, but now at the close of their business, uh, as a formality, make that motion. Thank you. The court, three minutes. Thank you. The court's made its ruling with regard to that, and that is still encompassed within the body of the charge. So, um, your other motion you're going to make later? However, whatever the court uh, yes. wants is fine. Um, have you uh, figured out or uh, essentially uh, your closing statement how, about how long is it? About two hours and 40 minutes, Sean. Hopefully a little shorter, but that's it. Okay. All right. Um, I'm going to step out. We're going to bring the
morning, everyone. Please be seated. Make sure cell phones are turned off. The trial in the matter of Douglas and Rosalind Barden versus Johnson and Johnson, David and Darlene Etheridge versus Johnson and Johnson, D'Angelo McNeil versus Johnson and Johnson, and William and Elizabeth Ronnie versus Johnson and Johnson. Today is September 4, 2019. Members of the jury, um, we are getting to closing statements today. So uh, thank you for your patience. May I have appearances, please, for the plaintiffs? Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning. Good morning, folks. Moshe Myman, Chris Pasatella, Chris Panettiere, on behalf of the Bardens, the Ronnings, the Etheridge's, and Ms. McNeil. Thank you all. Good morning. Thank you. On behalf of the defendants, Johnson & Johnson, and Johnson & Johnson, Consumer Incorporated. Good morning, Your Honor. Thank you. Good morning, jurors. Diane Sullivan and Jack Nolan. Good morning, Your Honor. Uh, and today, uh, of course, Ms. Sampson's with us, and we have uh, a lawyer who works for Jack and I, Mary Lisa Don, you're helping us today in uh, closing, and Darren, uh, thank you for being here. Thank you. Members of the jury, before we uh, proceed further, um, yesterday was apparent uh, to the court from one of the questions that you submitted yesterday afternoon that the instruction that the court gave yesterday morning perhaps was not clear, and I apologize for that. So I'm going to give that instruction, slightly modified, um, perhaps this will be um, clear. So, any assertion by the defendants, Johnson & Johnson, and Johnson & Johnson Consumer Incorporated, that D'Angelo McNeil's mesothelioma was not caused by Johnson's baby powder or shower to shower because of the alleged absence of any biomarkers or fibers is stricken. All testimony by Dr. Atanus implying or stating the D'Angelo McNeil's mesothelioma is not related to Johnson's baby powder or shower to shower because of the alleged absence of biomarkers or fibers is stricken. There is no basis in this case for Dr. Atanus to provide that opinion. Does the defendant, do the defendants have any further uh, witnesses? Uh, Your Honor, we just asked that the instruction be read, uh, read, but we have no further witnesses, and at this point, subject to the instruction, J and J rests this case. Thank you. Um, this is uh, the following instruction that has been um, uh, stipulated to by the parties. With regard to what J&J has reported to the FDA, the FDA has a number of databases where adverse events are reported. There are two reports that specifically name Johnson & Johnson's baby powder and mesothelioma in the drug reaction database. There are many more reports in the cosmetic products database. The FDA redacts the brand names associated with those adverse events under Exemption 4 of the Freedom of Information Act. There is no dispute that Johnson & Johnson sent MedWatch forms for the event reports Dr. Hopkins was asked about, including the ones for these four plaintiffs to the FDA. This occurred between 2017 and 2019. Okay. Any rebuttal uh, testimony uh, by the plaintiffs? <laughs> Thank you. All motions are preserved. Uh, let's now proceed to closing statements on behalf of Johnson and Johnson and Johnson and Johnson Consumer Corporation as well. Thank you, Your Honor. Morning, counsel. Hi again, jurors. It's, uh, it's good to talk to you again after all this time. Uh, you folks have been terrific. Uh, you are the best part of our justice system. And pretty soon it will be time for the lawyers to finally stop talking and for you all to speak to us with your verdict. And you have the power here, nobody else. Nobody gets to decide this case but you. Not the lawyers, not the judge, nobody. You decide this case and soon you'll speak to us with your verdict. And you came in here all those weeks ago, uh, and I know many of you didn't want to be on this jury, especially when you heard how long it was going to be, uh, but, but you said, yeah, I'll do it. Uh, I know it's an inconvenience, it's a burden, taking you away from your family, your job, some of you, your lives. But you said, you know what, I can serve. 
in the interest of justice. I can do the hard job uh, and do justice in a case like this. And it's hard to be a big company in a case like this when you have four really sympathetic plaintiffs. Really sympathetic. And, and we wouldn't be human if we didn't feel sympathy for what these people are going through suffering from cancer. But all those weeks ago, you said you could do that hard job. That you could decide this case without bias, without prejudice, and give even a big company a fair shake. And set sympathy aside. You looked into your hearts, and you looked into your conscience, and you told the court, and you told the lawyers, yeah, I, I know it'd be hard, but I can do it. I can hold the plaintiffs to their burden of proof and decide whether they've actually proved their case based on the evidence and set sympathy aside. And it's hard in a case like that to do it. And you came in here day after day, sometimes struggling to pay attention to the evidence when the lawyers and the witnesses were sometimes boring, right? And served with great patience and with dignity and with grace, even when all of us, the lawyers, were sometimes acting like children. I apologize for my part in that. And we were all proud of you. And you should be proud of yourselves, and our community members should be thankful to your service in the interest of justice. And if, if there was anywhere that even a big company could get a fair shake in a case when you have the most sympathetic plaintiffs, it was jurors like you who said you could do justice and decide this case just based on the evidence, even if it's hard. Even if it's hard. And it's easy to make the big company a villain, right, in a, in a lawsuit story. Who cares about, you know, big companies? And the, and the plaintiffs would like you to think that J&J &J is just a big, faceless corporation. But then you saw they put the names on that easel of all the people at J&J, &J, whose decisions they complain about here. And then you saw Dr. Hopkins, who was head of product safety for Tal, come in here and testify. You saw Dr. Nicholson, uh, the doctor they had on video, um, who talked uh, about some of the issues in the case. Dr. Musco, the burn nurse, who they also deposed. The people who they complain about, who they allege did the worst kind of things. I mean, they've alleged that this, these people hurt babies, hurt people on purpose. They, they knew that there was asbestos in their product and they continued to sell it. They've accused them of being monsters and killers. Liars and cheaters, the plaintiff's lawyer said in opening statement. People that have babies themselves, some of them grandbabies. You don't just drop your kids off for school one day. Some of them, like all of us, maybe help out at PTA, coach sports teams, volunteer work. You don't do that and then just go to work and decide to be monsters and killers. That doesn't make any sense. And you don't stay in business as long as J&J &J has by doing the kinds of things that they allege. And maybe some of you saw what was going on from the beginning. Because I submit to you, if you view the evidence through the lens of your common sense, you can see the difference between science and truth and facts in the real world and lawsuit fiction. Stories crafted by well-traveled, well-paid, multi-million dollar experts and the lawyers who hire them again and again to try to win lawsuits for money. And I submit to you that the crafted lawsuit story doesn't stand up to the evidence, to the truth, to the facts. And you saw in the beginning of the case when Dr. Longo was on the stand, Mr. Panettiere talked about banned asbestos products. Remember that? That there was asbestos in gaskets and brake pads and wall mud and insulation and other products. And then you heard that Dr. Moline their medical expert, Dr. Longo, their testing expert, Dr. Brody, their animal studies expert, Dr. Maddox, their pathologist, that all of those experts had testified again and again and again for plaintiff's lawyers in asbestos cases like this. Now these products are banned. And they had made millions. You heard, and the judge is going to give you an, an instruction that you can consider the amount of money experts have been paid 
in deciding whether to believe them or not, in deciding their credibility. And all of these experts have made millions and millions of dollars testifying again and again for plaintiff's lawyers in asbestos products for money. And those products are now banned. And they came up with a new target, right? Keep the money train going, these experts. Dr. Longo, over $30 million. Dr. Moline, over $3 million. Dr. Maddox, over $5 million. Dr. Brody, millions. Why all of a sudden, after 125 years, baby powder's been on the market? Why all of a sudden? J and JB, and they talked about the lawsuits, right? You've heard about the lawsuits since 2017. They've been filing lawsuit after lawsuit against J and J. They can get juries to believe that there's asbestos and baby powder and money train that goes on for a long time, right? A lot of people use baby powder. And what did they do to try to create a lawsuit story? They, resurrect, they resurrected and are repackaging, and I submit to you trying to resell an issue that was all over the news in the 1970s, that was investigated to death by the best third-party experts in the world, that the FDA investigated and concluded there was nothing there that there was no truth to this. 50 years ago, this was investigated and put to bed. Why all of a sudden now? Let's resurrect it. Maybe we can get juries to believe it. And if we yell asbestos, asbestos, asbestos enough in a courtroom, maybe we can scare juries into believing it's true, even without the evidence, even without the science. Because asbestos is scary. A lot of you, when we interviewed you, uh, and jury selection knew about asbestos and knew how bad it could be because, and they know that. Maybe we can scare jurors into believing that there's truth to this. And maybe they can convince some juries. Folks here are not that naive and not that global. This jury is asking very sophisticated, very hard questions. And maybe some of you saw what was going on. You can tell the difference between a lawsuit fiction and the science and the evidence in the real world. And who did they bring as the ringleader for their lawsuit story? The $31 million man. Remember he said, oh, I didn't make $31 million. My lab did. Then you heard he, he owned 75% of the lab, right? And he has testified 2,000 to 3,000 times in lawsuits. 90 95% of his work is for plaintiff's lawyers and asbestos lawsuits. He testifies every week, going from courtroom to courtroom helping plaintiff's lawyers, mostly plaintiff's lawyers, try to win lawsuits for money. He's listed by every plaintiff's lawyer in the country. Why do you think that is? Even if they don't ask him, they put him down. You think he's a sure thing? You heard he didn't even test the product. And when you think about the evidence in this case, ask yourself, why didn't the plaintiff's lawyer bring me one expert who actually tested the final product? They paid Dr. Longo a lot of money. They paid, remember Dr. Compton, the younger guy, testing expert, they paid him a lot of money. Dr. Weber, the guy that used to work in New York Department of Public Health, they paid him a lot of money. All three testing experts capable of testing. Not one of them did they have test the baby powder or the shower to shower. They have the burden of proof. Why didn't they bring you a testing expert that actually tested the product? He was just a testifier. They didn't bring any of the people from his lab who actually tested the product. And I'm going to show you why. And then you heard, when Dr. Longo got hired in this litigation in 2017 or so, when they first started suing J&J, &J, he went from jury to jury, the courthouse to courthouse, and depositions as well. And he raised his hand under oath and he said, oh, no, 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 no. I have never tested talcum powder before this litigation. First time. Never did. And then you heard that was not the truth at all. He had tested it several times before. In fact, he had to admit when they were suing brake pads and gaskets and other things, and he wanted to say it wasn't the talcum powder, it was the brake pads, he said, oh, asbestos and cosmetic talc, that's an urban legend. A myth, a story, a fairy tale. 
like Jimmy Hoffa under the Meadowlands, like ghosts, like vampires, Loch Ness Monster and Bigfoot. The notion of asbestos and talcum powder, he said, was a myth, a story. And then you saw his prior testimony. He was asked in 2002, under oath, talcum powder that was used on babies, did some of that contain asbestos? We've looked. We've not found it. Must be the brake pads. You had sworn in 2002 that you had tested talcum powder used on babies and didn't find asbestos. Answer, that's what it states. In 2003, have you ever found any asbestos at all in talc used for cosmetic purposes? No, I have not. And he tested with the most sophisticated testing, TEM, the super duper microscope, and the polarized light microscope. When he was trying to blame other asbestos products, like brake pads and insulation, there was no asbestos in cosmetic talc. And then, I think Mr. Panettiere asked him, oh, that was thousands of samples ago, so it's easy to forget. Is it easy to forget that you swore again and again? That you never tested cosmetic talc before? Then you saw another thing about Dr. Longo. Depending on who hires him, he says something different from lawsuit to lawsuit. When he was representing a cement company being sued because a worker had mixed cement that had asbestos in it, and the guy had inhaled these asbestos fibers day after day after day at work for years, he said, if that was only trace, that wouldn't give you a significant exposure, right? Same the exact opposite thing here. He's claiming he found asbestos in talcum powder but at trace levels, like 17 millions of 1%, 57 10 millions of 1%, 2.4 thousands of 1%, exact opposite. And they say now it's significant exposure, that, that trace amount, which was the exact opposite of what he said in the other lawsuit. The truth shouldn't change depending on its harm. He also said, remember uh, the Scott's fertilizer? He was working for the defendant in that lawsuit, and I asked him, well, aren't you concerned that there's asbestos in fertilizers? Fertilizer, there's babies and puppies and kids running around lawns. And he testified in that litigation, no, XRD, the x-ray, and the polarized light microscopy, that was the accepted standard method. Nobody was doing TEM at the time, right? That's what he said. And then he criticizes J&J, even though we did way more than that. Now he's saying, oh, no, that's... Even the TEM, that's not enough. So we should have concentrated, which I'll talk to you about. The truth shouldn't change depending on who's paying you and who you're suing. Before being hired by J and J, he said no asbestos in cosmetic towel, urban legend, a myth. Now, oh yeah, cosmetic hired to sue J and J. Flip flop, cosmetic towel contains asbestos. No asbestos, he swore. I tested it with TEM. No asbestos in talcum powder used on babies. Baby powder contains asbestos, he swears now. Trace levels of asbestos is not significant exposure. It's saying the exact opposite thing, depending on who's paying you. He did not use concentration when testing cosmetic talc when he did it in 2002 and 2003, even though he said the heavy liquid density concentration has been around forever. Even though Dr. Blount's paper had been published in the peer-reviewed literature talking about heavy liquid concentration for 10 years. He didn't use it because nobody used it. TEM was the most sophisticated method. You didn't have to concentrate when you had the super-duper mic microscope that went down millions and millions of a percent, saying the exact opposite thing now to try to win a different lawsuit. Said PLM and XRD, the polarized light microscope, and the X-ray was enough. Scott's, oh no, no, j, j has to do even more than TEM. The complete opposite. The truth shouldn't change. The truth should stay the same. It should change depending on who, who's paying you and who you're suing. And then, he acknowledged. He was just here testifying. He didn't look through any microscope. He didn't look at a single sample of Johnson's baby powder or shower to shower to, sh to talk about how he found asbestos. He sat up here, and you folks watched him, and he looked at pictures that other people took, and he said, oh yeah, that's asbestos, that's asbestos, that's asbestos. 
Why didn't they bring you the people that actually did the testing? They have the burden of proof. Not a single expert. They brought three, and not one of them who tested the project. The testing expert who didn't test, just tested by. He was good, right? He can explain his way out of anything. He can convince you it was pouring down rain on the clearest day of the year, right? Maybe he can convince some juries. But maybe not this year. Then they brought Dr. Moline. They paid her millions too. These plaintiff's lawyers have put her on the stand in other cases suing paint manufacturers, asbestos product manufacturers. And then she told you, she talked about the Helsinki criteria. And you folks remember the Helsinki criteria said, first you have, to, you have to look at biological markers of asbestos, whether anyone has any evidence of scarring in their lungs or fibers in their tissue or asbestosis in their lungs. First you look for that, and the Helsinki criteria says, well, if you can't find that, just ask people. Take a careful uh, exposure history. And she actually said she's given talks about it, that, that she's lectured about how important it is to give up, to take a detailed exposure history from a patient to see about their asbestos exposures. That, that, that was critical to the diagnosis and to determining what caused the, uh, the mesothelioma. And then you saw she didn't do it here. Right? She didn't, she didn't interview a single plaintiff, a single one of the four, before she concluded J and J is the cause. I J and J is the cause. In fact, you saw that the plaintiff's lawyers filed these four lawsuits saying J and J baby powder and for Ms. McNeil shower to shower and baby powder was the cause of their mesothelioma before they even talked to her. She said, oh, she was asked, but the truth is in all of these cases, plaintiffs had filed their complaints months before alleging J&J &J caused their cancer, months before you were even sent the information about the case. And she said, yeah, that appears to be the case here. They already sued saying it was J&J before they even talked to her. And then Dr. Moline said, yep, J&J is the cause. Rubber stamping the complaint without even talking to a single plaintiff. She, you know, look at this. She said they had none of them, not one of the plaintiffs, had any evidence of biological exposure, no biomarkers. That's their own expert. Their only expert on medical causation has admitted, and we'll look at it, that not one of the plaintiffs had any trace of asbestos exposure in their lungs, in their tissue, on their x-rays. And then she didn't even interview them before she concluded in her report, yes, J and J is the cause. She examined and interviewed Mr. Barden after she already concluded it was J and J. And then right before this trial started, she talked to Mr. Etheridge for about 30 minutes after she had issued her report two years ago saying J and J is the cause. And she's still never talked to or interviewed Ms. McNeil or Mr. Ronnie, even though she said that's the most important thing. What's going on here? The difference between science and medicine in the real world and lawsuit fiction, the lawsuit story. And then you heard that Dr. Moline, in her real world medical practice, where she sees patients, not in lawsuits, she never <coughs> once has determined that Calcium powder was the cause of their mesothelioma. Never. She only started doing that in lawsuits after being hired by plaintiff's lawyers against J and J. And you remember this testimony, Mr. Maiman, plaintiff's lawyer here, actually put Dr. Moline on the witness stand a couple of years ago, or four, four or five years ago, in this courthouse. And that's when they were trying to blame a paint company who had uh, dust uh, in the paint uh, that they allege had asbestos in it. And she was asked by Mr. Maiman, isn't it important to look at the Miller and Minor epidemiology in determining causation? And Dr. Moline, you remember, testified, it's the most important thing. The Miller and Minor epidemiology is the best evidence. Look at the people with the highest exposure. That was her testimony a few years ago when they were suing against a paint company. 
And now she said, oh, no, no, no. Sue against somebody else. Not a minor epidemiology, not good. She testified in that case, where Mr. Maiman put her on the stand, that the very studies that J&J relies on here, the Italian and Vermont epidemiology studies, the very studies that J&J relies on here were the best evidence and they showed no increased risk of mesothelioma. Those studies haven't changed. Same studies. She had no criticisms of them then. In fact, she said they were the best evidence. She's changed 180 degrees. The truth shouldn't change based on who you're selling. Studies haven't changed. <coughs> and then Dr. Weber. Remember Dr. Weber? He was the New York public health uh, official. He used to be a public health official in New York. Now he's not. And now he's acknowledged 100% of his earned income comes from plaintiff's lawyers. Suing in asbestos lawsuits, 100%. And Dr. Weber said yes to Mr. Maiman's questions over 200 times. Anything he asked him? Yes. 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 And yes. And another testing expert who didn't test any product. And you remember, and actually he was the most qualified of all the tests. He, he went around certifying labs. He was a, uh, a well-qualified testing expert. And Mr. Maiman said, oh, you were tired. That's why we didn't send anything to you. And he said, oh, no, I, could I have access to labs. I could have tested if you sent me it. He could have. They didn't want to risk it. They had Dr. Longo, the sure thing. They were going to chance Dr. Weber not, not saying, oh, yes, there's asbestos. Why didn't they have him test? And when Dr. Weber was a public health official, he said the exact opposite thing than what he told you viewers here. He actually agreed with J&J when he was an official trying to protect the public health. Here's what he said. While a particle may well be defined as a fiber when it has the 3 to 1 ratio, it may not be an asbestos fiber. Just because it's 3 to 1, he said, that doesn't mean it's asbestos necessarily. That's the exact thing that J&J has been saying here. That's what Dr. Atanus was talking to you about. Just because it's got the same length doesn't mean, because we've got the good rocks and the bad rocks. And they don't like me saying good rocks and bad rocks, but the government, and we'll look at it, does make a distinction between the ones that are harmful and the ones that are not. And Dr. Weber agreed with that when he was trying to protect the public health. He also said, and, cle and remember we talked some about, and Dr. Tanis talked about cleavage fragments, and that's when you crush up the good rocks. You know, they're milling and mining, and there's this, and there's this, uh, uh, and all of these, right, the trace levels are invisible. If there's this uh, almost unmeasurable trace amount of cleavage fragment because it got mushed up, you can have one of these. And you heard from Dr. Tanis, these rocks, I mean, these are ubiquitous. All of us are, are breathing these all, all the time. These, these are ubiquitous in the Earth's crust, these good rocks, uh, because the overwhelming majority of uh, rocks are not asbestos rocks. Uh, and Dr. Weber said that when you crush up these good rocks, cleavage fragments are not considered hazardous by many. The exact opposite thing that he came in here and claimed now. Now that he's testifying as a paid expert for plaintiff's lawyers, he's changed his mind. Okay. The truth shouldn't change depending on who's paying you. And I asked him, do you have any science? Do you have any studies? Do you have anything that made you change your mind? He couldn't come up with one. The plaintiff's lawyers, after he couldn't come up with them, said, oh, oh, you remember that California, the California EPA Region 9 thing that had to do with that dirt in, Cal some dirt in uh, Colorado? that there was uh, an issue whether it had asbestos, and they said something about cleavage fragments uh, in there. But then you heard that the big EPA, the United States Geological Service, looked at that and said cleavage fragments were not harmful. And Dr. Weber said the same thing when he was trying to protect public health. <clears throat> so before he started being paid and earning all of his earned income from plaintiff's lawyers, he agrees just because it's three to one doesn't mean it's asbestos. Oh, well, now it is. See, these fragments weren't hazardous. Oh, well, now they are without any studies. 
never, oh, and he was a testing expert who actually published a testing standard in 2014, including how to test for talc. There's nothing about heavy liquid concentration separation. Another story he's come up with after he left the public health. Now he's saying, oh, you should concentrate. But he published a testing standard that didn't say that at all. Again, ask yourselves, what's going on here? Why is things so different? Your Honor, I just have to check. Something is barking at me over here. Yeah. And I can't pay attention. You got to return like that. Thank you. Um, Dr. Compton, another plaintiff's expert, testified for plaintiff's lawyers over 200 times. Never has testified for defense. Another expert who's been well-traveled and testified against the brake pads and the insulation. Uh, and another testing expert who did test the final product. He tested ore. But you heard J&J did exploratory sampling to see what ore to use. So you have to test the final product to see if there's a asbestos. Why didn't he? He could have. Again, why did they have three testing experts and not one of them tested the final product? And Dr. Compton was asked how much money he made. He couldn't tell you. Maybe it was too much to count. Who knows? He wouldn't tell you. Uh, and then, so what else did they do to come up with the lawsuit story? Well, J&J produced millions and millions of documents in this litigation, some of them going back to the 40s and 50s. And they selected out a few, and I submit to you, they showed you one line, cherry picked that line without showing you the rest. Showed you one document without showing you the document that makes clear uh, what the story really is. I mean, it's easy to manufacture. Uh, imagine someone picking out uh, anything you've said over you know, 20 or 30 years and just showing one piece of it, and not the rest, not the whole story. And I'm going to show you some examples of what they did here. And they kept talking about company documents. You didn't see the company documents. The company documents don't support their case. The company documents, have been, as you heard, have been on J&J's website for the public to see uh, for a year or so. The company documents, their, their most challenging part of this case is the company documents say again and again that by TEM testing, polaroids, light microscopy, x-ray diffraction, Test result after test result from the best labs in the world, no asbestos in Jane they tell Unless you spin and cherry pick and try to mislead based on what you're showing and what you're not on the company documents. And so as part of the lawsuit story, we talked about how they are resurrecting this issue that the FDA and other investigators put to bed. These two New York scientists, Dr. Lewin and Dr. Langer, sounded the alarm claiming they found asbestos in baby powder back in the early 70s and shower to shower, Dr. Lewin. But then you saw, what did J&J do? They didn't say, oh, no way. There's no asbestos. That's garbage. They said, oh, my God. And they sent their samples, they sent samples out, including Dr. Lewin's samples, to the best experts in the world. MIT, Harvard, MIT Princeton, Colorado School of Mines, Carnegie Mellon. University of Cardiff, the best, te Macron, the best testing labs in the world. Ask yourself, are they all part of the conspiracy? Is MIT and Princeton all saying, oh yeah, we're going to hide the fact that there's asbestos and baby powder? That case doesn't make sense. The best experts in the world, each independently, not together, each at their own labs, independently looked and said, no asbestos. It's not the truth. And the FDA, to their credit, also sent this Dr. Lewin samples, this New York scientist who claimed there was asbestos in Beta, out to three independent labs, and they concluded, this is the FDA document, there is poor correlation between Dr. Lewin's results and the findings of other investigators. And then they, the plaintiff's lawyers would say, oh, well, there's one guy, Dr. Hutchinson, who agreed with Dr. Lewin. He was from the University of Minnesota Space Center. And remember, they asked, Dr. Nicholson about that at length. And then you looked at Dr. Hutchinson's report, and you heard from Dr. Hopkins. Dr. Hutchinson was an expert in a testing methodology, SEM. And so Macron said, test with this kind of microscope, SEM. Uh, and he didn't find anything. He said, oh, I'm going to try TEM too. Well, Macron and Dr. Pooley 
were universally respected experts on TEM. They had already done it on TEM and found nothing. But Dr. Hutchinson said, I'm going to try it on TEM, even though McCone said, you're the SEM expert, do that. And then he said, oh, it was hectic. And McCone got his report, and they said, Where is, this is just notes. Where's your formal report? Where's your backup? Where's your micrographs? Where's your missing information? The best lab in the world like, what's this guy doing? And you know, they, they went after Dr. Nichols and said, well, why didn't you send this to the FDA? And Macron's the one who made the decision that this was a piece of garbage. So Macron said, here's our TEM results. Here's Dr. Pooley's TEM results. Here are all these third-party MIT, Princeton, other third-party results. This is not reliable. And Macron made the decision that this was not something that should be sent. And when you look at what he did, this guy from the Space Center, in Minnesota, 3,000 grids, he said, he, example, he, he looked at in two hours. That's two seconds a grid. No wonder he messed up. And all of the other TEM testing by the best labs in the world confirmed that Dr. Lewin samples did not have asbestos. And then, even better, and I submit to you, and I told you in opening, the best evidence comes from people that have no interest in this case. Forget about the plaintiff's experts. Forget about my experts. Look at the people that don't have an interest, right? They're not being paid. The FDA is being paid to protect the public health. And they did their job here. They jumped in. It's just some baby powder. Oh, my God. Of course the FDA is going to jump in. They jumped in and they did their own testing in 1976. And Dr. Lewin, he actually retested, too. And remember, he claimed to find chrysotile in shower to shower. But when he retested, he said, you know what? Maybe not. I'm not sure now. And the FDA, there's no chrysotile in shower to shower. And the FDA and Dr. Lewin, no chrysotile or asbestos in baby powder at all. Non detect, non detect. And the polarized light microscopy that the FDA used, Dr. Weber acknowledged, their expert acknowledged, much more sensitive method than Dr. Lewin. Remember, Dr. Lewin just used x-ray. The FDA used the Polaroid light mic microscope as well as another testing, and they didn't find asbestos. They said there isn't any. And they said, well, that's only a non-detect. Non-detect down to one-tenth of one percent. And you saw this document where the FDA has not identified chrysotile in over 200 samples. And good for the FDA. They jumped in and did their own. They weren't going to just take Johnson and Johnson's work for it. They weren't going to take even MIT and Princeton's work for it. The FDA did their own testing and concluded there's no, there's no truth to this. This was back in the 70s. So why are they resurrecting and trying to repack it and resell it now, the losses? And even their own experts, there's never been chrysotile in Johnson and Johnson's baby pack. Even their own experts. And chrysotile is a bad kind of asbestos. No, uh, and, and even Dr. Atanas, who doesn't think it causes mesothelioma, says it causes lung cancer and uh, asbestosis and scarring. And Dr. Longo, he said, I've never found chrysotile in any J&J &J sample, concentrating, not concentrating, PLM, TEM, any way you looked at it, you've never found chrysotile. As I stated yesterday, that is correct. Dr. Compton, you didn't find chrysotile in any of the samples from the top order deposit. That's correct. And even Dr. Lewin, to his credit, he said, yeah, you know what? There's no asbestos in Johnson's baby powder. He issued a retraction to the Wall Street Journal in 1973. He's never changed that statement. So why are they repackaging and reselling something with a guy who actually did the test said, I was erroneously quoted as having reported that Johnson's talcum powder contained 2 to 3 percent asbestos. I found no evidence of asbestos in nine of the samples. <laughs> And the other two samples fell into the inconclusive category described above. These results are not seriously at variance with those reported by the investigators. I didn't find evidence in nine samples. I couldn't conclude in the other two. I agree with the company's independent investigators. That was his final statement. He said he was erroneously quoted. And good for him for saying, you know what, I messed up. And maybe he did see Dr. Lewin, although everybody else said it wasn't in the sample, but Dr. Weber said it was common in the early 70s to have a stray contaminant of chrysotile because people were using asbestos filters in these microscopes, chrysotile filters. And in fact, you heard he wrote his PhD statement on that, that there could be stray 
contaminants in the lab of chrysotile because they were part of the microscope focus back in the 70s. Then you heard them, the plaintiffs talk about this shower to shower G11 issue. But when you actually look at the document, Macron's testing document, it shows that when, you, when they tested the actual shower to shower product, products all seem to be quite clean and we did not find any fibers of the asbestos form materials in any of them. And what they did say is in this additive, in a separate pile of this additive, G11, that was used back in the 60s, uh, there was a, a contaminant. Just like Dr. Weber and Dr. Longo also, you can find this back then, because there was asbestos in the filters, you could find a contaminant. But it wasn't in the shower to shower. And then you heard a stipulation that the court read that both parties agreed to, that this G11 was not part of the shower to shower formula beyond the second quarter of 1968. No plaintiff in this case alleges they used shower to shower until 1989. Only Ms. McNeil is alleging that she used shower to shower in this case, and not until 1989. So what does this whole issue even have to do with this case? When you don't have the testing results on the product at issue I submit to you, you reach for innuendo, speculation, allegations without evidence. And then they talked about Dr. Langer, the other uh, New York scientist who claimed to find asbestos. He was the guy from Mount Sinai. Uh, and he published, uh, not in the scientific literature, but in the press, a claim that he found asbestos in baby powder. And then the FDA, to their credit, tested. And they investigated. And the FDA said, nope. A spokesman for the FDA. And here's a, uh, uh, an article about Dr. Lewin Langer. Maybe he retracted. Maybe he didn't. Who knows, but the FDA says the results of our testing, no detectable content of asbestos, and only minor amounts in another product, not J&J. &J. But in J&J, &J, the FDA said Dr. Langer got it wrong. FDA has no interest in this case, I'm trying to protect the public health. And then when Dr. Langer actually had to stand behind the peer review literature, in the peer review literature, when he actually had a uh, publish a paper that talked about his testing of uh, talcum powder products. For Johnson's baby powder and Johnson's, uh, for 4 and 20, both Johnson baby powder samples, in the pre-publication draft that uh, a scientist sent J&J &J as a courtesy, and they said something, oh, there's something wrong about J&J &J getting draft. There's no evidence that J&J &J ever changed a word of any stuff. Scientists, no scientists at J&J, &J, they said as a courtesy, it's a, your, your product, here's the draft. The final results were the same in the draft as they were in the published paper. No asbestos, Dr. Langer, publishes to the peer-reviewed scientific community. When he actually had to stand behind and defend his scientific results, he published there was no asbestos in Johnson & Johnson's paper. Because that's the truth. And the FDA agreed with that. And actually, you saw the best experts in the, in the world agree with that. J&J had sent it out again, laying the Langer samples to uh, independent experts uh, to, to test, and they found no asbestos. And then you saw Mount Sinai, where Dr. Langer worked, admitted they made a mistake. And you know, when you have a big company, it's sort of like I have a big family. Sometimes people say things that aren't right or embarrass you. And you saw some documents where people, uh, uh, one guy at J&J was calling anybody that criticized talcum powder, an antagonistic personality. Well, that wasn't a very good thing to write. But you know what? If somebody falsely accuses you of something, get mad. But we don't have asbestos in our baby powder. The best labs in the world have tested MIT, Princeton. We don't have it. And they get mad. It's like, that's not right for you to be saying that. So yeah, they went in to Mount Sinai, and they, they, they showed them all this data. And they said, this is not right. And Mount Sinai, Mount Sinai they didn't want to issue the press um, report that they had made a mistake because it was embarrassing for them. They're like, let's just let this blow over. But Jason said, no, that's not right. You caused all this false alarm about our product. And so Mount Sinai said, yeah, we made a mistake. And they issued this press where they stood up and they did the right thing. Any implication in the news stories that most of the talcum powder currently on the market contains asbestos is not borne out by the most recent data from the FDA. The most commonly used baby talc has been consistently free of asbestos that's the J&J &J product, it is the opinion of Mount Sinai's Department of Pediatrics that baby talc is a useful and safe product. 
And then the plaintiff's lawyers uh, said, oh, that's because somebody in J&J was on the board of Mount Sinai. Where's the proof that he had anything to do with this? Everything sinister, innuendo, suggestion, without evidence. The FDA agreed. And Mount Sinai said, yeah, we messed up. Dr. Langer messed up. And you know what? When Dr. Langer published his paper, he didn't find asbestos in J&J. He found it in other stuff. And Mount Sinai has no problem blowing the whistle on companies. They're famous for, for actually Dr. Solokoff at Mount Sinai, you heard, was the first one that found that asbestos causes mesothelioma. Mount Sinai has no problem blowing the whistle on corporations when there's an issue. And they, but they realize that Dr. Langer messed up. And there's no asbestos in baby powder or shower shower because Johnson & Johnson has been looking for it and screening for asbestos-like particles since the 40s. You saw that they have, and this is not the only product j and makes, they have the most sophisticated quality assurance, quality control, uh, and some of you who work for companies know about this kind of stuff. They know how to test and make sure products are safe. And they have very detailed specifications where you have to use microscopes, even back in the 40s and 50s, uh, to screen out any kind of asbestos-like particle. And then you saw in the early 70s this uh, standard by industry, and the FDA was involved in coming up with a testing standard after the scare, and there was a determination that testing with x-ray and polarized light microscopy uh, would, would detect asbestos down to one-tenth of one percent. And so the FDA and industry said that's the testing we're going to adopt. And uh, it wasn't a regulation, but the FDA was on board with, and they were part of the testing procedures and protocols, and we'll talk about the round robin. And J&J &J made clear in this document, we know that industry's adopting this, the X-ray and the Polaroid mic, but you know, we've been doing more than that for years. We've been doing that plus the TEM, the expensive super duper down to 20,000 uh, magnification, 800 times smaller than a grain of sand. We can find parts per million. And we've been doing that as part of our regular protocol since 1973, and you saw Dr. Hawkins said they were doing it uh, on some stuff since 71, but certainly on all of their lines since 73. They were using the TEM on the ground door, using X-ray and PLM, the microscope on the flash dry tap, using another kind of microscope, looking for all these things with all these microscopic uh, techniques to make sure they didn't have any asbestos in baby powder, including, as a double check, sending it out to Macron again uh, the quarterly final composite top of powder to make sure on a regular basis. Exceeding industry standards, substantially exceeding, even their experts said, yeah, they were, they were, yep, they were doing way more than others, way more than the industry standards. Of course they were. They knew people were using this on babies. They had babies themselves. There's no way they're going to sell baby powder that has asbestos. And so, they did what's called a composite sample, and you guys heard what that's about. That's, so you get a representative sample. And I think you heard the plaintiff's lawyer saying, well, for TDM, remember they were saying, oh, we chomped these breath mints, and you know, you guys didn't test any more than a breath mint by TEM. Well, that's because, then you heard Dr. Compton talk about, that's because the TEM microscope is, you have to look at particles down to millions of a, of a percent, so you only can put a little bit. You can't put a ton of stuff on these people, a little tiny speck. And so that's a representative sample for a TEM microscope. And they do statistical analysis to make sure whatever they're testing is representative of the whole. A very sophisticated, as you'd expect from a company like J&J &J, uh, protocol to make sure that the final samples meet their testing requirements, including their absolute mandate that their product be asbestos free. And they concluded the testings concluded again and again that there was no asbestos in Johnson & Johnson's talcum powder. And they took composite samples off the line every hour, every shift, five days a week, 49 weeks a year, over 170,000 samples. And they sent it out not to anybody. They didn't send it any Tom, Dick, and Harry. Jay and Jay didn't fool around. They went to the best lab in the world. Dr. McCrone's lab, even Dr. Longo has testified, literally the best in the world. In fact, McCrone's lab trained Dr. Weber, their other expert, on how to do TEM. They were the experts. You think McCrone's going to put their considerable reputation on the line and let a company sell baby powder that has asbestos to babies? You 
think MIT and Princeton is going to let that happen? you think the FDA is going to let that happen? To believe Plaintiff's case, you have to believe there's some big conspiracy. That all of these people said, oh yeah, let, let J&G sell asbestos and kill people. And you have to believe that Dr. Longo, the guy who never tested the product, the guy they paid 30 million, the plaintiff's lawyers have paid $31 million to, he's the only guy that knows how to test. The only guy to find the truth. Ask yourself, even if you don't like big companies, does that make any sense? And Macron, the best lab in the world, said since 1971, when they started doing this for J&J, the Windsor product, that's the Vermont top that J&J used in talcum powder, free of asbestos. Always been our opinion and continues to be our opinion based on 15 years of closely examining the product. That's the best lab in the world saying that. They don't have an interest in this lawsuit. They're saying that independent of a lawsuit. And then you heard a triple check. J&J had this worldwide top monitoring program. Even all the quality assurances on the line, all of the testing, all the quarterly testings. Then they would say, everybody around the world, send your samples from the warehouse back. We're going to make sure that we don't have asbestos in baby powder. It's not something, and that's, not, that's another thing that doesn't make, it's not something you're going to hide. Baby powder's on the shelves. Anybody can test it if they want to. It's been on the shelves for 125 years. And J&J called back all their samples, not all, but representative samples from the warehouse, and they tested it again and had Macron do TEM of all these uh, microscopes and found no asbestos in their product. And they continue to do these worldwide audits over the years, 70s, 80s, 90s, up to today, as you heard Dr. Hopkins talk about, and again and again, clean. The product's clean. Then you heard Dr. Weber say, well, the reason why Macron and others weren't finding asbestos is because you handcuffed the analysts with your protocol that you had to find five fibers or 20 if they were different. But that wasn't the truth. Then you heard what we did, what J&J &J did, they don't know anything about TEM. They went to Macron. This is Macron's published method on top. They just copied it. The method was Macron's method. And the five fibers had nothing to do with counting. It was what you needed to give a weight. When you have these invisible, almost unmeasurable trace amounts of something, you can't weigh it unless you have a couple. And so they said to weigh it, you need five. But you still count it. Here's J&J's protocol. Every effort is made to possibly identify any fiber. Each asbestos mineral is recorded. They record each and every fiber. You, count it, you call it asbestos only if it is asbestos, but you still count it if it's not. And then you saw all the evidence where Macron, this is some ore testing with some stray contaminant, and we'll talk more about this time. But they recorded if there was one. There's lots of evidence. What we'll recorded if it's one? So this thing that Dr. Weber talked about, oh, you handcuffed the analyst, you didn't record it unless it was five. It's just not the truth. They recorded it if it was one. And then you hurry after this scare in the 70s, J&J, in addition to going to Macron, MIT, uh, Princeton, they went to Dr. Pooley, and you heard a fair amount, about Dr. Fair amount about Dr. Pooley. Their own expert, Dr. Brody, said that Dr. Pooley was one of the most well-respected testing experts in the world. And again, J&J didn't go to any Tom, Dick, and Harry. They went to the best experts in the world. And the reason Dr. Pooley was so good at it is because, as you heard from Dr. Tanus, there was a lot of problems with asbestos in the UK uh, and, and Wales at the time. And he had a lot of expertise in testing asbestos. And he actually went to J&J's mines in Italy and in Vermont. And he said, you got some tremolite? And we told the FDA about that, and we'll talk more about that. But it's not asbestos. And he went back to 1949, testing these, the five zero talcus, the Italian talc that Jane Day used in Great Britain and the United States. There's no dispute about that. Uh, and he said that there was no asbestos in shipments from 1949. And he said the same thing about the Vermont talc, not asbestos form and character. And then, to the government's credit, again, they didn't take everybody's word for it. They actually went in the Vermont mines themselves, right? NIOSH, again, people that don't have an interest in this case. The government, the scientists from the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health, scientists from the uh, Occupational Safety and Health Agency, two government agencies, and scientists from Harvard. They actually went into the Vermont mine, and they took air samplings all over the Vermont mine, and they took bulk samples of the product from the Vermont mine, and they tested with 
the best uh, methods available, the petrographic microscope, the x-ray, and the step scanning, and the transmission of super-duper microscope. No asbestos. They couldn't find it anywhere. And none of the air, air sampling. Nowhere in the mine. None of the bulk samples. These were three mines, including J&J. &J. The government said, you know what, baby powder is so popular, and this is so important. I'm going to go in the mine myself with my scientists and with Harvard. And look, the facts and the science and the peer-reviewed published literature doesn't add up, doesn't support the lawsuit story, the lawsuit fiction. And the FDA continued to test. In 2009, 2010, they went again, they used the TEM uh, microscope and the PLM, the polarized mic, the two super, the super duper and the other one that's pretty, pretty uh, sensitive. And they, they looked down to four parts per million. Limited detections down to almost nothing. And they found no asbestos in Johnson's baby powder, no asbestos in shower to shower. Uh, again, people have no interest in this case. Not the best evidence I submit to you. Not for plaintiffs or not for defendants, but for the public health. And you, you know, when you don't have evidence to support your case, you criticize and you attack and you go after it. Like, oh, the FDA didn't know how to do it. Oh, MIT didn't know how to do it. Oh, Princeton didn't know how to do it. Oh, the epidemiology studies are no good. Where is their evidence? This was Dr. Weber's method, as you heard. Now he's critical of what they did. But the FDA, independent, contracted a lab who used Dr. Weber's ELAP map method, used the super duper microscope, and found by two methods, no asbestos in J&J's baby powder. The independent experts agree. People that have no interest in this lawsuit. MIT, Dartmouth, Carnegie Mellon, Princeton. Are they all in on this conspiracy? Or is the truth that there is no asbestos in J&J's powder? And then they come up with this constant, you've heard a lot about the concentration method. Well, they had to come up with something to explain away all of these test results that found no asbestos in J&J's talcum powder. How do you explain away all of these test results? They're like, well, even though Dr. Longo never did it before for talcum powder, uh, uh, even, even though it was been around forever, as he, as he said, having de de density liquid separation, he comes up and says, the reason no one can find it but my lab is because I'm concentrating and it's more sensitive. I'm making the towel go to the top and seeing asbestos on the bottom. Well, Dr. Blount, the Rutgers professor who actually was the first to publish on the method, she said, that's not true. It's not more accurate. It's equally accurate. It's just faster. Dr. Longo uses Dr. Blount's method and she published, it's not more sensitive, it's equally accurate. This concentration is the thing is just a story they had to make up to explain away all of the negative testing. And does it even make sense that Dr. Longo, the $31 million expert, is the only one that knows how to test for his test? It's not MIT, not Harvard, not NIOSH, only Dr. Longo. And, and Dr. Blount didn't use her polarized light, the, didn't use TEM. If you use TEM, you don't have to concentrate because you're getting down to the most sensitive parts per million. And then the reason that the government and J&J &J and others don't use heavy density liquid se se separation as a test is because you can't find the most common form of asbestos. Does it make any sense to concentrate to test when you can't find the most common form of asbestos and that's chrysotile asbestos and you can't find it? Uh, and both those experts admit you can't find it. Why would you use a method where you can't find the most common form of asbestos. And here's the FDA. Again, the FDA involved uh, here. And uh, the plaintiffs uh, showed you, uh, I think, an answer to interrogatory where J&J &J said there's no pre-market testing required by the FDA. Well, that's true because talcum powder's been on the market for 125 years before the FDA even existed. And so for products that have that history of safety, the FDA... Objection, Your Honor. This is outside the scope. Sorry. I can move on, Your Honor. We'll move to strike that. That uh, comment is stricken from the record. Ms. Sullivan, please be careful. Sure, sure. So the, F so the FDA did not require um, pre-market testing, uh, but you saw the J&J, &J, before they released any product, did substantial amount of testing, right? Before they had released product to the public, they did x-ray, they did polaroid light, uh, and then since the 70s, they did TEM. So they did do testing before they released it. They just didn't do testing um, 
like they do for drugs, we do clinical trials and things like that, that pre-market testing. But they did a uh, substantial amount of testing before they released it uh, to the public to make, to make clear it was uh, safe. And the FDA uh, stays involved and has authority over cosmetic talc to the extent that they can require you to warn of a health hazard, and we'll see and talk about that. They can require you to take your product off the market uh, if, uh, if they find a health hazard. They can inspect... Objection, Your Honor, again. Sidebar. The evidence is the opposite. And I'm trying to now the need an instruction. It's not outside, but it's in the citizen's petition that they can do and not do. It's, they cannot recall it. If the, the FDA stated this year, they cannot recall it. When, when the Claire stuff came out positive, when the, when the Claire samples came out positive this year, we showed this in um, our motion of limine, they said, we don't have the power to recall it at all. So that statement is false. I'm just trying to on the um, I don't want to be back here with okay. yeah. Before anything else. Yeah, yeah. I'm just going to I'm going to show the citizen petition and say they have a lot of power. Hold so on. I'm going to show the citizen's petition and say they have power to run a warning, which they clearly did in the citizen's petition. The citizen's, the citizen's, yeah. citizen's petition is in evidence. Okay. Argue from the citizen's petition. Yeah. Comments with regard to the FDA are stricken from the record. And we'll talk about the um, citizen's petition that makes clear the FDA had the power to require a warning and the power to find that you had a health hazard on your on your product. And the FDA was involved here uh, in determining what was a good testing method. And so they had their scientists analyze testing methods, and they determined that this concentration method that the plaintiffs are saying J and J should have used, uh, they couldn't find chrysotile with it. So they're the same thing. They rejected it as a testing method. The FDA said that, that they couldn't find chrysotile concentrating uh, using the concentration method. So why would you uh, adopt a method that doesn't find the most common form of asbestos? So the FDA did not agree uh, with Dr. Longo that the concentration method was a good way to test for talcum powder. They looked at it, they examined it, and they said, why use a method that doesn't find the most common form of asbestos? And then uh, sometimes lawyers... Um, like to use props, uh, maybe when you don't have evidence. And you saw the bathroom scale um, show here, where they put ping pong balls on the bathroom scale, and then they put ping pong balls on the jewel jeweler scale. And they said, oh, the concentration lets you find something when um, it's because it's more sensitive. Even though Dr. Blount, who invented it for talc, who published on it, said it's equally accurate, not more sensitive. And then you saw all of us could see with our eyes the ping pong balls, and J&J &J using multiple SWAT, like a SWAT team, multiple testing methods. If you don't see one thing with x-ray, you can see it with PLM. Some things you can see it with TEM that you can't pick up their morphology, the, the color and, the, uh, and the, the, the shape of the fibers that you can pick up with PLM. Uh, so when you use all the methods, just like we can see with a different method, our eyes on those scales, you can find asbestos. Law, lawyer shows and props are not evidence, right? Where's your evidence? The FDA said their concentration method wasn't any good for test and talent. And when you don't have evidence, sometimes you have to create it. And so you saw that they said, they gave Dr. Hopkins, when he was testifying, the corporate representative who was from um, the UK, worked in the US for a, a, a while as well, but he sat up here. And then they showed him two binders of uh, reports, and they said, well, you're saying that J&J denies that talcum powder causes mesothelioma, yet the company said it was possible in these reports. Remember that? Then it turns out each and every one of the reports in those two binders, each and every one of the reports in those two binders were because the plaintiffs had filed, the plaintiff's lawyers had filed a lawsuit. And the company, as part of their internal policy, like a good company should, they have a protocol that says you have to put it in as possible when you get any report. In accordance with company policy, all spontaneous cases are considered possible at the time of entry. 
So they create the evidence. They file a lawsuit. We got to lie it as possible because you don't just dismiss it. You look at it. You investigate. And they ask Dr. Hopkins these questions, even though Mr. Panettiere had taken Dr. Hopkins' deposition many times over several days. And he knew that J&J had done a clinical review of a bunch of these adverse event reports and found that there was no evidence, did not identify any data to provide evidence to indicate a causal association between the product use and the mesothelium. So they create their own evidence. They say, we'll file these lawsuits. You say it's possible, because we have to. That's what a good company does. And then they do an analysis with the doctors, and they say, no, the evidence doesn't support it. They knew that when they were asking Dr. Hopkins that. You also heard the judge gave you an instruction that both sides agreed to. These adverse event reports that J&J has been getting since these lawsuits started in 2017, they've been sending all the ones in those binders Dr. Hopkins got, all of them went to the FDA. They went to the FDA. The FDA knows about this. The FDA has never changed their mind that there's no hazard with talcum powder. The FDA has never required a warning. They've never changed that stance. They know about these lawsuits. Everybody knows. You saw they show you the New York Times article from last year. There's no secret. A lot of you said in jury selection, you know. The plaintiff's lawyers talked about, the plaintiffs themselves, some of them talked about the lawyer commercials. There's no secret. The FDA knows this, these allegations are there. They don't believe it's true. They don't believe it's supported by the evidence. All of those adverse events driven by lawsuits. Most times you get adverse events from doctors, right? Your doctor reports them. Every one of them, I think he found one out of hundreds from somebody that wasn't a lawyer. It might have been a duplicate of a lawyer, but one. But none from any doctors. It's been all over the press. Doctors know about it. They know about this issue. There's no science to support it. Where's that evidence? All of these reported, and there's, um, they may claim, oh, all the stuff in the complaint, you don't put in, this is the FDA has a very specific format that requires you to, they require you to fill out, because they have a, um, uh, and I'm not as good as with computers as some of the folks on the other side, but they have computer systems where you can uh, pull up and log the exact kind of information you want. So the FDA has a very specific format in terms of the information they want. And they may say, oh, well, you didn't put all the information that's in the complaint in the form. We put what the FDA wants you to put, what they dictate you put in this MedWatch form. And J&J sent each and every one of these serious adverse reports, these allegations from these lawsuits to the FDA. And the FDA confirmed receipt. It's an FDA number on, the, on their website of each and every one of them. And what's the testing evidence here? The testing evidence comes from the guy who didn't test, but it, uh, uh, he talks about how, what his lab did. And all of the bottle, many of the bottles he got from plaintiff's lawyers came from eBay. Remember? The bought from eBay. Some came from plaintiff's lawyer's relatives. Uh, and they have the burden of proof. No testing expert, no biological markers of asbestos exposure in any of the plants, and no bottles of talcum powder that any of them used that could be tested. He didn't test any bottles that the plaintiffs used. Some of you may have caught this when he said, what does your common sense tell you about this? Every single bottle J and J talcum powder that Dr. Long would just pull, pull off the shelf and test it. Even he had to admit, you couldn't even see anything that, that they can call asbestos. Nothing. All the off-the-shelf bottles, even they had to admit, no asbestos. And even he said in, in almost 40% of the bottles that they tested, they couldn't find any fragment they could even call asbestos. Nothing. But everything off the shelf, no asbestos. And they talked about exposure analysis, and that's what um, you do to figure out if there is asbestos, if you're getting more than background, how much, you know, they simulate the exposure. Like they, they do, they, they model in this lab how you use the powder, and then they collect the dust to simulate how much, if there is asbestos exposure you get. He didn't do an exposure analysis for a single plaintiff in this case. He's done it in other cases, but he didn't do it for any of the plaintiffs here. When you, when you got four really sick and sympathetic plants against a big company, I guess they think they don't need any evidence. 
They didn't, even, they didn't bring me one. They talked about shower to shower, Ms. McNeil's bed sheets. They didn't do an exposure analysis to see whether that actually causes more than background inhalation. They didn't do that study if there is asbestos. They didn't do a study about how, uh, where, she, where she, she alleges she puts it in her boots. No exposure analysis. No exposure analysis for how Mr. Ronnie used it, how Mr. Borden used it. They just used one for some other plaintiffs who used it in no way like Ms. McNeil. Say, oh, you know, the jury won't care about the evidence. They have the burden of proof. They didn't bring you it. you got to bring it. Even if you got a case against a big company, you got to bring it. And they used 70 and 80-year-old unsealed bottles for his exposure, the two exposure analysis he did that don't relate to these plaintiffs. He used the oldest bottles he could find, one from the plaintiff's lawyer's relative, remember that? Holes were as big as, much bigger than they are now. Even he had to admit asbestos fibers could fit in there. What's going on here? I submit to you the plaintiff's case when it comes to the company documents. When you don't have evidence, you cause confusion. You try to cherry pick. You try to mislead. And I want to show you that. Your Honor, this may be a good time to make sense for a break. Members of the jury, going to take the uh, break now. 15 minutes to ready to come back upstairs to line up. If you have not yet received this case and have discussions with regard to it, um, you know the and the conduct of the We're on sidebar. Yes. Miss Tom. There is a motion in limine at the beginning of the before the beginning of the trial. And I made a ruling. And you have violated that ruling during the course of the trial. And now again during summations. Using terminology such as lawyer shows and props. When you don't have evidence, sometimes you have to create it. I don't know how many times I need to review this with you, and I'm just going to add this conduct to the pending motion. Lawyer shows and props. When you don't have evidence, sometimes you have to create it. How do you think that that comports with the rules of professional conduct? In, your, in response, the adverse event reports were created by lawsuits, so that's consistent with the evidence. And so lawyer, are, lawyer and shows so, and props. They were props. No counsel. And second, and and second Your Honor, I think it's fair to point out the difference between the story and the allegations, and that's, that's typical on the evidence. Lawyer shows and props and accusing the attorneys of creating evidence um, is not a fair comment on the evidence. You are attacking the profession. Um, you've been warned about this. There's an order that was entered with regard to this. And you have the responsibility of knowing the RPCs just like everyone else. So I think you should be careful in the remainder of your summation. Is there anything further for the record now? Uh, Your Honor, I have a long list, which I was just going to wait till the end of summation, about things like that that have been said. And I would have you jump up and down out of courtesy. I'm sure, I'm sure Mr. Pettit will have done things yes. different than me. I have plenty. If, if, if Your Honor, if, the, if they're preserved, we can do it at the end. They're preserved. Okay. But I caution you um, to proceed accordingly and to be mindful of your responsibility to your client to comply with the rules of professional conduct. Thank you. Thank you. 